So uh, thank you so much for that uh, kind introduction, for inviting me um, here today. And you know, being at a conference, the 23rd annual conference named after Hyman Minsky, uh, made me start thinking more um, about economic volatility, how it's changed over time, what lessons we can draw from how it's changed over time, and to think more broadly about the question of macroeconomic stabilization. And I wanted to share some of those thoughts with you today. Um, some of those thoughts will draw a certain amount on the economic literature and, and things that are maybe a tiny bit technical for some if you don't spend a lot of time in economics. Um, some of it may be um, you know, at a higher level, and we'll post a version of this that's a little bit more extensive in terms of footnotes and some of the background on the web in the next hour or two, so you can read more there. But the organizing principle I wanted to use to examine this question is to look back at a debate that began in the economics profession in the late 1990s. And a hypothesis was put forward called the Great Moderation. The Great Moderation referred to the reduction in volatility of a wide range of economic variables and the associated increase in the longevity of economic expansions and the infrequency of recessions. At the time, the debate was not whether or not there was a great moderation on the basis of the longest economic expansion in American history and then followed by a mild recession. No one doubted that the great moderation was a fact. The debate then was, was it better monetary or fiscal policy or improved inventory management or expansions in consumer credit or maybe just good luck? You know, of course, the debate over the causes of the Great Moderation ended abruptly with the onset of the Great Recession in late 2007. And with the worst economic crisis of our lifetimes still fresh in our minds, there seems little danger that the debate is going to restart anytime soon. If anything, the media appears to become increasingly sensitive to day-to-day -day fluctuations in economic data reports. For example, um, just recently, I remember the S&P rising 1% on initial estimates of fourth quarter GDP growth coming in above expectations. But then just a week later, the market fell 2%, um, largely on the new order subcomponent of the ISM. In the wake of the Great Recession, it's worth reassessing the Great moderation hypothesis and understanding what it means for policy going forward, asking questions like, was the idea spectacularly wrong? A bunch of people talking about moderation right up until the eve of this enormous recession. Did they capture some truth about the economy? Um, and is there any aspect of that that is relevant going forward? Um, what I'm going to do now is talk about what the great moderation looks like with 10 or 15 years of additional data since people last looked at it. I'll then use that to explore a little bit the factors that led economists to think it happened in the first place. Then I'll talk about some of the major problems with the great moderation, problems that Hyman Minsky would have had no problem in identifying and understanding. Um, third, I want to talk briefly about why economic stability matters, although I can't imagine um, there's anyone in this room who's not converted on the topic. And then finally, give an outline of what I see as the unfinished agenda to promote macroeconomic stabilization. To start, I um, want to look at um, volatility of economic data in the recovery. So this is since the Great Recession ended, and if this worked, what? Oh, excellent. Um, this shows the standard deviation of quarterly real GDP growth on the left side and the standard deviation of monthly non-farm employment growth on the right side. And the great moderation is the fact that the standard deviations of these series is started to decline in the mid-1980s, and they became less volatile. And as you can see here, if you ignore the Great Recession, and that's a huge if that I'll come back to, and just look since then, month to month or quarter to quarter, 
the economy has actually been less volatile in um, the course of this recovery. Another way um, to look at this issue is to revisit some of the metrics that people used, economists, in contributing to this literature. And one of the important ones was um, Olivier Blanchard, who's now the chief economist of the IMF, and his co-author, John Simon. And they looked at a rolling, uh, five-year rolling average of the standard deviation of um, quarterly real GDP growth. And what you see, if you reproduce exactly the same analysis they used to decide there was a great moderation, first of all, you can see why they thought there was a great moderation. Volatility was much higher in the 50s and 60s and 70s, and then came down by the mid 80s, and it sort of went up and down in, in booms and, and recessions, but it stayed low. If you look at their measure, volatility went up in the Great Recession, but was still lower than what it was. Again, this is their measure. Um, we'll talk about the meaningfulness of it. We'll come back to that. And volatility has since come down. So the types of things economists were looking at to say there was a great moderation appears that with um, a massive and notable exception, um, you still see it in the economic data. I want to briefly talk about what is causing this moderation that we're seeing at higher frequencies or maybe even at medium frequencies in the data. And as I said, the debate was, is it good luck, which is fewer shocks to the economy, good policy, which is better ability to offset the shocks, or good structural changes, which is changes to features of the economy, like improved inventory management or composition shifts to less volatile industries. Um, the version of this I'll post on the web um, in an hour or two will have more detail on this, but researchers at the time, um, and this is drawing on my colleague who's a member of the Council of Economic Advisors, um, Jim Stock, and his co-author Mark Watson, found, uh, concluded, and this is a quote, that the moderation in volatility is attributable to a combination of improved policy, and they gave 10 to 25 percent of the credit to that, identifiable good luck in the form of productivity and commodity price shocks. They said that was 20 to 30 percent. And unknown forms of good luck that manifest themselves as smaller reduced form forecast errors, which they gave about half of the credit for the moderation to. Looking at um, the evidence of the last 15 years, I think most of that story stays broadly intact. In particular, it doesn't look like there's something in the structure of the economy that makes shocks propagate themselves any less than they used to. If you have something that hits the economy, it continues and persists and lasts, a bad thing, for example, or a good thing, um, to about the same degree that it used to. What's really changed is, um, again, you know, with this big caveat we'll come back to, that in normal times, it seems like fewer bad things hit um, the economy. How to interpret that um, is not just luck, though. If you have more predictable monetary policy, then even if a shock hits your economy, people may react less to it because they assume it'll be offset. Or you could have you know, what we've had in some ways in the last couple of years with a drought, disruption of Libya's oil supply, <coughs> European sovereign debt crisis, and a set of exogenous events you know, all of which are negative shocks, but to some degree, um, you know, maybe policy response preemptively addressed some of these shocks, or maybe some of them showed up um, you know, and appeared to be trend growth rather than um, an error. But broadly, that story stays the same. I think two places where you look back at the original explanations people had for this and think maybe um, either they weren't right or they don't hold up as well, um, first is inventory management. Um, it had been observed that inventories used to be pro-cyclical. When um, sales started to fall, businesses would at the same time um, cut back on their inventories, and as a result, production would fall quite a lot, and that would bring the economy down, and as the economy expanded, um, the opposite would happen. During that um, great moderation, period, the reverse happened, and inventories started to be um, counter-cyclical. And if sales were going down, inventories would go up, and production 
was staying more constant. Um, if you look at the data, including the Great Recession, or even looking at the data since the Great Recession, what you see is that pre-1984 relationship between inventories and sales appears to have been reasserted itself, or at least moved a large way in that direction. And so inventories um, have not been playing overall um, the type of stabilizing role that they did from 1984 through the Great Recession. Um, another theory for the moderation was that financial innovation allowed more people to borrow or get insurance. That allowed them, when something bad happened to, that lowered their income, to borrow, to smooth themselves through that, and made their consumption much more stable. The fact of consumption stability has continued, and especially in something like um, consumer durables, that's an important part of the story, why the higher frequency volatility in the economy is lower. It just seems a lot harder to think that that's due to financial innovations when credit in the wake of the recession has gotten um, considerably tighter for many households and they still um, seem to be able to smooth consumption in many of the same ways um, before. Um, another point about financial innovation, obviously, and this is the segue from talking about volatility in the economy at high frequencies, which is what I've been discussing until now, to talking about volatility of the economy um, at lower frequencies, which is what I'm going to shift to, is that in good times and normal times, um, financial innovation may allow someone to borrow and smooth their consumption. Of course, that same financial innovation also makes it possible to create or to magnify a shock that can lead to a large downturn in um, economic activity. And in fact, that played um, an important role in the Great Recession. So if you look at um, the types of metrics I've just been showing you, all of which show the economy quarter to quarter, year to year, or even over a couple year period, um, it would seem that what economists called the great moderation is um, still with us. I don't think, and many of the same forces are causing it. Some of them um, have changed. Some of them are more of a puzzle. And I don't think that's utterly um, irrelevant. But it's certainly not the most relevant fact about economic instability. And you know, the great risk, you know, there's certainly no sense in which the recession itself, which witnessed the largest peak to trough downturn in GDP you know, in the post-war record, was indicative of a more stable economy than we had in the 1950s and 1960s. And to understand some of the problems with some of the statistics people, economists, were looking at, and I was just showing you, um, are well illustrated by looking at this graph, which shows the fluctuation of GDP annually. And you see the moderation from the mid-'80s. You see a brief interruption in 2007, 8, and 9. And then you see that moderation reasserting itself. The next graph is the same exact concept but instead of looking at deviations of GDP on a one-year frequency, it follows something that Bob Hall did um, about 15, uh, 10 years ago and looks at fluctuations in GDP over a 10-year window. And over a 10-year window, it looks like this. Um, a huge amount of instability, and obviously we're well within the 10-year window of the Great Recession that is still with us. And Fundamentally, the most important part of stabilization policy, and the one that at least looking backward that we haven't yet gotten right, is what to do about those lower frequency, larger um, tail events that are what you know, most people think and worry about um, when they think about it. You know, it is, of course, much harder to make statistical inferences about rare events especially when the structure of the economy and policy itself is changing, and changing partly as a function of 
those rare events itself as they change both policy practices and business practices. Um, that said, based on recent experience, it would be foolish to be complacent and fully assume that in the deeper, lower frequency sense, there ever was a genuine great moderation, let alone that it has returned and renders further policy steps unnecessary. But before discussing the unfinished policy agenda for macroeconomic stabilization, let me briefly describe why macroeconomic stability is so important. And the importance of it is a topic that's never been particularly controversial um, with the public or any purveyor of common sense. But there have been a set of, um, in some cases, more academic theories, for example, um, the idea that output fluctuations are optimal or nearly irrelevant because the economy just bounces around in response to productivity shocks, or the fluctuations are relatively costless to people as compared to growth, which matters um, you know, much more. I think when you take a look at that set of ideas, there's a whole range of problems, but I think the most fundamental range, uh, the fun most fundamental problem is that downturns don't affect everyone equally. And when the economy goes down 5%, that doesn't mean everyone's income falls 5%, which would be a problem and something we'd worry about. Um, but it means something worse than that, which is 5% of people's income falls 100%, or that overstates it, but something closer to 5% of people's income falling 100% than 100% of people's income falling 5%. Um, moreover, the 5% that lose their jobs aren't picked at random um, from the population. And the next chart is a familiar one uh, to many, and it shows the black-white unemployment gap and the Hispanic-white unemployment gap. And you see how much those rose in something like the Great Recession, and how, as they've come back down, um, it takes a long, they're able to go up a lot faster um, than they are coming down. A second. Um, objection you sometimes hear to stabilization policy is that output fluctuations are actually supportive of future growth. And the most famous uh, proponent of this idea was Joseph Schumpeter, who said that, quote, recessions are but temporary. They are a means to reconstruct each time the economic system on a more efficient plan. You know, in other words, um, the relative returns of productive activities to productivity enhancing activities falls in recessions, increasing the return to productivity enhancing activities and fostering more um, innovation. You know, theory, evidence, and common sense, however, suggest that the opposite is true. Um, a range of research has pointed out ag in aggregate and in specific cases the ways in which higher volatility can be harmful for growth because of increased uncertainty, reduces investment, especially when firms must commit in advance to a certain scale of production. That R&D, for example, goes down in a downturn, so you don't just lose the GDP during the downturn, but you potentially lose out on some of the research you would otherwise um, have done. And um, that as a result, an economy that's less stable is an economy that's spending more of its time, on average, um, below full employment, and an economy where people, on average, and in some cases, in specific, quite severely, are poorer um, than they'd otherwise need to be. Um, finally, the third objection to stabilization policy is that even if fluctuations are undesirable for distributional reasons, or harmful or neutral for growth, there's still nothing we can do about them. Um, this is a view that goes back to President Herbert Hoover. It's formalized by Milton Friedman and is one you hear, hear increasingly commonly, um, a sort of resignation or liquidation, a strain about you know, efforts to continue to return the economy to its full potential. Um, I think you know, while this could be a useful caution at certain periods and moments in history against trying to fine tune the economy, um, it's a potentially dangerous perspective when the economy is clearly operating below its potential. And although it's making progress and returning to it, um, will be operating below its potential um, for 
a period of time. Um, you know, which brings me to uh, you know, the last topic that I wanted to cover in my remarks today, and that is the unfinished agenda for economic stability. I think improvements in monetary and fiscal policy have contributed to the patterns in the high frequency data that were termed the great moderation, though you can always debate the share of credit that they deserve. I also believe that policy steps have played a critical role at lower frequencies as well. And the best example of that is the Great Recession itself, which in many ways started off looking like it could be as bad or worse than the Great Depression. Um, stock prices were on the onset of the Great Recession were generally tracking um, what was happening at the onset of the Great Depression, but housing prices were falling much more this time around, and as a result, the total shock to wealth was much larger. The Great Recession, um, the onset of it, witnessed global trade volumes falling even more sharply than they had in the early stages of the Great Recession. And Alan Greenspan has argued that short-term credit markets froze more severely in 2008 than in 1929. Um, in large part because of an aggressive policy response, the unemployment rate increased five percentage points compared to a more than 20 percentage point increase in the Great Depression from 1929 to 1934. Um, you know, nevertheless, um, you know, very significant hardship has been caused by the Great Recession. And despite steady progress, it continues to linger and have consequences today. Much of the response to the Great Recession was necessarily ad hoc and improvised, with policymakers being forced to develop unprecedented new tools and approaches to address what was an unprecedented situation. As the economy continues to heal, now is the time to continue working on what can be done to put us in a better position to prevent or respond to future downturns. We have made progress in fostering institutions and rules that will promote macroeconomic stability, but there's a great deal of unfinished business. You know, most discussions of macroeconomic stabilization center around monetary policies, questions like different rules and ways it's implemented in practice. Um, in my remarks today, I won't have anything to say about monetary policy, and that's because I'm institutionally and appropriately precluded from commenting on that topic. But I do think sometimes the discussions um, have maybe focused too exclusively on monetary policy which, while very important, um, may lead um, policymakers to underemphasize some of the other areas that are also um, important for macroeconomic um, stabilization. And I want to describe four of those areas now, noting that in many cases, macroeconomic stabilization wasn't necessarily the goal of the policy, um, but is an outcome of the policy, and to the degree it's an outcome, it's not an accident, but to some degree um, a feature of the broader economic theory underlying those policies. Um, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. The first area is improving fiscal stabilizers. And um, you know, many economists have had a longstanding skepticism of discretionary countercyclical fiscal policy, citing all sorts of lags and political constraints. You know, um, a more widely but not universally accepted exception to that would be when monetary policy is constrained by the zero lower bound and the output gap is large and persistent, which is the conditions we've had um, for the last five years. In this context the, context, the usual lags are not an objection, and the discretionary multiplier may be even larger. Um, moreover, by preventing permanent damage to the economy's growth path and investing in things like infrastructure that enhance long-term growth, discretionary fiscal policy can, in certain macroeconomic environments, 
um, potentially even pay for itself. In the current um, cycle, I think the evidence pretty clearly shows that fiscal policy played a key role in uh, bringing the United States back to its pre-recession GDP per working age population more quickly than we've seen other countries around the world or the United States in the past. And I think it's important to appreciate, and this is highlighted in the next chart, that it's not just the Recovery Act, which is that blue line, but we nearly doubled the Recovery Act with subsequent measures like payroll tax cut, extending unemployment insurance, tax cuts for small businesses, additional incentives for infrastructure, which is the discretionary fiscal policy embodied in that orange line. And then all of that discretionary fiscal policy was again nearly doubled by the automatic stabilizers, which bring you the total fiscal expansion um, that we saw. We've also, um, if we're thinking about the next business cycle, uh, meaningfully strengthened the automatic stabilizers. The most important step we've taken in that regard is um, the Affordable Care Act. It's not something that you normally think of as counter-cyclical macroeconomic policy, but it is. Um, the combination of progressive tax credits and the Medicaid expansion will significantly help households smooth consumption and will expand aggregate demand when it otherwise would have been um, impaired. Although macroeconomic stabilization wasn't the goal of the Affordable Care Act, its benefits in that regard aren't an accident either. In general, policies that strengthen social insurance, helping people when their incomes are lower, will have a broader macroeconomic benefit in the form of increased stability. In that vein, the additional progressivity in the tax code we've implemented, including expanded refundable tax credits and higher taxes on higher rates on high income households, also will contribute to economic stabilization. And going forward, um, it's worth continuing to explore whether there are further steps that would expand automatic stabilizers and strengthen the counter cyclical features of key programs, including means-tested programs. Um, additionally, as we think about the significant challenge of elevated long-term unemployment today, um, these types of steps to enhance the automatic stabilizers would help those individuals experiencing extended spells, and to the degree we cannot prevent it, would provide relief um, during those spells. And you don't need to fix our entire economic system um, to do something very simple, and that would, be, uh, that would matter a lot right now and that would be for the House of Representatives to pass um, what the Senate has already done to extend um, unemployment insurance for the over two million Americans who have lost their benefits and are working hard um, looking for jobs. The second area for macroeconomic stabilization policy is another area where macroeconomic stabilization is not the principal goal um, but isn't an accidental byproduct either, and that's broader efforts to reduce pre-tax um, income inequality. Economists at the IMF have identified a link in the cross-country data between lower inequality and longer periods of growth, generalizing a story that Raghu Raghan told quite well in his book, um, Fault Lines. Um, looking at the United States over the last several years, um, the challenge right now is not to have greater stability in consumption. It's actually been quite stable since the recession, but to strengthen it. And one way to do that is to boost incomes for lower income households who have higher marginal propensity to consume on average. And a range of short run steps like raising the minimum wage or long run steps that expand opportunity by expanding access to preschool will all help um, produce a pre-tax um, income distribution that's less, that's, that's less unequal and thus an economy that is potentially more robust and um, equal. Drawing on other work um, by the IMF, you know, there's the observation which you see here in this chart which is that the share of um, income going to the top 1% and the share of aggregate debt to, debt to GDP have closely tracked each other. And 
I think we need to think a lot more and harder about what's causing what and how both of these are related, but it does provoke you into thinking about whether the relationship between inequality and debt, and we know a certain amount about the relationship between debt and that type of low frequency um, tail event economic instability we're most concerned about. The third area of macroeconomic stabilization policy, and here it is more of a, a goal um, than, than a um, complement to it, is improving financial stability. And in this regard, I think we've made substantial progress, and the biggest piece of unfinished business is housing finance reform. Um, everyone's familiar um, with Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act and the complementary reforms that are designed to provide multiple firewalls against future crises, reducing the chances, um, you know, in everything from consumer protections to systemic oversight to higher capital requirements to resolution authority. Um, but the thing we haven't finished is um, you know, one of the contributors to the crisis, um, and you can debate the, the share of the contribution, which is the um, housing finance system. And in particular, um, you know, we have been able to, by placing Fannie and Freddie into conservatorship and infusing them with liquidity in the midst of the Great Recession, help foster a housing recovery. But if we want to make further progress, it would be best served by moving forward with a system that puts private capital at risk, protects homeowners, creates a vibrant competitive marketplace, and includes broad, transparent support for broader home ownership. Um, in addition to all of these goals, one critical and sometimes underappreciated goal of a reform system is that it should enhance macroeconomic stability. The residential sector has historically been one of the most cyclically volatile, and a well-designed system can help lean against the wind um, in that volatility. Um, so that even if there are disruptions in financial markets, the housing finance system should con still continue providing reasonably priced mortgages to credit-worthy um, borrowers. Encouraging cyclical resilience means ensuring that the structural pipelines through which credit flows from the secondary market to mortgage originators are exposed to limited credit risk. It also means setting up an institutional structure in which the federal government can expand quickly in the event of financial market disruption or economic downturn from its ideally remote position to one that temporarily ensures funds keep flowing to qualified um, borrowers. We need to make sure that history doesn't um, repeat itself at the expense of taxpayers and the economy as a whole. Um, but we also need to make sure that we're putting in place a robust system that can help lean against the wind um, in future cycles. And to that end, the Senate Banking Committee is making promising bipartisan progress, and the administration looks forward to continuing to work with Congress to forge a new private housing finance system that better serves current and future generations of Americans. The fourth and final policy area is improving um, international stability. Um, because macroeconomic stability doesn't just depend on policy steps in the United States, we know the huge consequences that international crises can have on our economy and economies um, around the world. Uh, one very um, simple common sense step in this regard is that in 2010, the G20 leaders and IMF members agreed to a landmark set of reforms to modernize and strengthen the IMF. These reforms ensure the IMF has the resources the fund needs to safeguard the global economy and give greater voice to dynamic emerging economies that want to play a greater role in the international financial system. That's very much in the interests of the United States. It's critical to ensure our continued leadership of the IMF, central to our national security and our economic interests around the world. Ratification in the U.S. Congress is the final step before these reforms can go into effect, and Congress's failure to act jeopardizes our influence in the IMF and undermines our international leadership. 
Beyond the IMF's role in managing crises, it's also worth noting that developing countries around the world can benefit from the types of improved macroeconomic stabilization policies that I've been discussing, and that more broadly, there's a relationship between income growth and economic stability that you can see in um, my final chart. And what's particularly striking is the cluster of countries in the upper left with high income and low volatility including the United States, Canada, Japan, Australia, and much of Western Europe. Um, in conclusion, as a turbulent economy can seem from day to day or from month to month, as turbulent as the economy can see from, seem from day to day or month to month, it is important to put these higher frequency fluctuations in perspective. Um, a combination of volatility from everything from animal spirits to weather to feedback cycles will always impact the economy. But if anything, these shocks are smaller today. The consequences of these shocks are smaller today. And that represents a meaningful public policy accomplishment. But the Great Recession, at the very least, put the declaration of victory on the Great Moderation in substantial perspective. There's much more to macroeconomic stabilization than smoothing quarterly or annual fluctuations. The ultimate goal is to address the largest and most persistent fluctuations. In the case of the Great Recession, partly policy failed to do that, um, although the fact that we avoided a second Great Depression is a testament to improvements in macroeconomic and financial policy. Ultimately, macroeconomic stabilization isn't the only thing we care about and isn't even the most important. We care about returning the economy to its potential. We care about expanding the potential of the economy to grow. And we care about making sure that everyone shares in that economic growth. But better macroeconomic stabilization, especially for the larger lower frequency tail events, is both an important end in itself as well as generally a complement to all of these goals, helping to speed the recovery, to increase growth over time, and as we've seen, policies that help everyone share in that growth lead to a more stable economy, and vice versa, a more stable economy um, can help ensure that everyone continues to benefit from it. I don't know if you have time for questions or what you want to do, but, uh, but I, I have time. My name is Tanvi Rakram. I'm with ING Investment Management. My, you showed in one of the charts the, um, the association of rise in aggregate debt uh, to GDP and the share of income going to the top 5%. Could you elaborate a bit more on the mechanics of it and your own thinking uh, on this? Sure. I mean, in some sense, you know, this is a, um, I was drawing on an IMF study by Kumhoff. Uh, Ranciere and Winnant, and you know, I don't think there's a whole lot more to it than saying, you know, these two things, you know, tracked each other. Oh, I won't try to find it again. Um, tracked each other pretty closely, and that that's something that you know, in looking at, I'm intrigued by. I haven't spent as much time on it as I'd like to. Um, I don't know that the economics profession has figured out the answer to it, but you know, if a lot of people are, you know, don't have you know, any wealth and are going deeper into debt and then a shock hits the economy, you know, because of increased inequality and a shock hits the economy, they're gonna respond that much more in terms of their consumption and that's going to exacerbate the shock, and that's going to exacerbate their consumption and form a vicious cycle. And you know, a more favorable distribution of income can mute um, that whole dynamic and mute the propagation of a, of a business cycle. In that way, yeah. Paul Mueller, George Mason University, um, PhD student. I was wondering if you could comment briefly on the work of Casey Mulligan and the idea that unemployment insurance and benefits have actually promoted and prolonged the level of unemployment. I think there's, if you look at the broad range of economic research, I think it broadly refutes that notion. 
and that unemployment insurance, um, first of all, has a demand side effect and has a supply side effect, and the relative weight and importance of the different effects depend on what the unemployment rate um, is. On the demand side, if the economy is operating below potential, so you don't have sufficient aggregate demand, you're putting more purchasing power in the pockets of people who are most likely to spend it. That has a Keynesian impact of helping to expand the economy, which creates jobs and lowers the unemployment rate. Um, on the supply side, you have um, two effects. One is the mulligan of you know, somebody will be a little bit less likely to take a job or look as hard for a job if they can get unemployment insurance. And we'll talk about the magnitude of that in a second. Um, but you also have somebody who, um, and in the last decade, researchers have increasingly emphasized this, might have given up looking for a job entirely, left the labor force, and instead, um, in order to continue to collect unemployment insurance and not lie to the person they speak to every week um, and the reassessment you get at the end of your regular benefits, will actually look more for a job, stay in the labor force, stay attached to it so that as the economy comes back, you know, they'll be prepared to work. If you ask about the relative ratio of those two supply side effects, it depends a lot on where the economy is. And when you have a still nearly um, two people looking for every open job that's out there, which is you know, still worse than the average um, in a normal period, um, it's much less likely that the constraint on the number of jobs you create is you know, how hard people are looking as opposed to the constraint being the number of jobs there are, and that's where the demand side um, helps you. Um, it is, though, appropriate to have a trade-off, and that's why the you know, bill that the Senate passed includes triggers. And as the unemployment rate comes down in states, the number of weeks of, uh, of unemployment benefits they get um, go down as well. And um, you know, I don't think anyone who believes in unemployment insurance at all, I don't know whether or not Casey does or not, but anyone who believes in it at all would think that you wouldn't have an optimal system where when your unemployment rate was higher, um, you had more of it, you know, whatever it was. So, yeah. I'm Charles Temple with the Career Center for National Finance. Uh, usually after a Minsky moment, we have deleveraging. In this country, we had deleveraging of revolving credit, but we've seen student loans continuing to grow to such an extent the total credit is continuing to go grow. And so that probably did have a moderating influence on it. Um, I'm wondering to what extent this is sustainable, because I, at least anecdotally, when I went down to talk with people in Occupy Wall Street, found a lot of people who had student debt who were not going to be able to pay it off. And this appears to be a growing problem. Not that I'm against financing people going to school. I'm just worried about, is our society building up something which may not be very sustainable? Right. Can I ask you, um, how many George Mason PhD students did you find at Occupy Wall Street? Uh, not in the New York area. <laughs> OK, just, just checking. Um, the, uh, you know, I think you're at, there's a macroeconomic question and there's an education policy question. Macroeconomic, you want to look all in and you want to take into account not just the level of debt but interest rates. And if you look at interest as a share of disposable income, it's fallen from a peak of 13% down to 10% and is now the lowest on record. And those records go back to 1980. So I think we have, at an aggregate level, aggregating everyone, and aggregating um, all forms of debt largely gone through the deleveraging process. And that makes me a little bit more optimistic about consumption going forward and the sustainability of the economy going forward. Um, of course, what I just described was aggregating across all people. So middle class people have a higher fraction of their wealth in houses rather than the stock market. And stock market's gone up more than houses, so they've seen less of that. And I said aggregating across all types of wealth. So averaging in the student debt with everything else. Um, I think if you look at the middle class, you know, it's still a lot of struggle. Um, and I think you're right that student debt is you know, one particular place you see that. Um, and you know, doing things um, like the types of reforms we're trying to do on college financing, college access, college quality, I think are all part of how you address that and maybe could be added to the list of ways in which policies whose principal goal is not macroeconomic stability, 
actually have that as a side effect and have it again, not by accident, but because of the broader economic theory of the, of the case that animates both of those. I think I probably only have time for one more uh, question. Uh, I'm Bob Barbera. I'm not from George Mason University. Okay. Uh, so you've been an advisor to policymakers uh, through the Great Recession. If you had the opportunity to go back in a time machine and change one policy uh, in the aftermath of the Great Recession, what would that be? I think the Recovery Act was unprecedented in its scale and scope. And together with the subsequent fiscal actions and the automatic stabilizers, made a huge difference in um, complementing other policies to help save us um, from a second Great Depression. But after we passed the Recovery Act, we had to come back and extend unemployment insurance, extend, you know, get a payroll tax cut, extend a payroll tax cut. And each time we had to do that, it was a big political fight and there was uncertainty and sometimes there were even lapses in those programs and you did it, um, you know, retroactively. Um, you know, that's why I think, you know, the concept that um, you know, some have talked about of maybe having included triggers in that, so if the unemployment rate stayed high, certain of those things would have gotten automatically extended. I don't think the economy would have done a whole lot better, because as I said, we sort of fought and struggled and got our way to the same place that the triggers, um, for the most part, would have gotten you to. But it would have made it easier and let you, um, you know, continue to focus on you know, other things rather than just what should be a routine piece of business um, for Congress, like extending unemployment insurance. Oh, oh, well, uh, I can't blame me. I wasn't working for the George Bush administration. Uh, that, that, that grossly oversimplifies the causes. I'm not trying to say that. Um, one thing. I mean, there's any one of a couple different things. I think if you'd had a resolution, yeah. what? Yeah. I mean, no, no, any one of a couple might each individually have been sufficient. Um, you know, better supervision, having a resolution mechanism in place, having higher capital, um, you know, and, and a lot of that was the legal structure, but some of that was what you could have done, um, you know, within the legal structure you had. So anyway, um, thank you very much. Thank you.